All right, welcome back. So um, I did this, just uh, check through this stuff, and yeah, I um, didn't put the 442nd in the uh, in any of these. Um, a lot of stuff gets cut out just for the sake of moving through stuff quickly. Um, so that's all stuff that I usually have in my uh, U.S. history stuff, including like Korematsu VS and stuff, uh, VUS and stuff like that. So really quickly, just to run down on the 442nd, um, basically towards the uh, kind of middle of the war as America realized we were desperate for troops. We finally allowed um, Japanese Americans to sign up for the military. And surprisingly, a lot of them chose to, even though, you know, we were interning them. And uh, the most famous uh, Japanese regiment was the 442nd, also known as the Nisei, um, Nisei being second generation. And the 442nd is significant because it is actually in proportion to its size, the most decorated unit in all of American history. Uh, basically, in total, they got more medals and honors than they had people in the regiment. Um, and like the one of the most well-known uh, stories from the 442nd, because they mostly fought in Europe, they didn't trust uh, Japanese soldiers enough to, to send them into the Pacific. Uh, there was a position that was being held by Nazis in the mountain, um, and they, they were holding out for months uh, because they basically had had hold themselves up in this mountain cave and behind them was a cliff so you couldn't get up through that way and then leading up to the mountain they had these machine gun nests and just every time our troops tried to attack they would just mow us down and we couldn't get in there and we couldn't bomb them out because we'd have to bomb through an entire mountain so the 442nd gets called in and overnight they they scale up this sheer cliff and what's really impressive aside from you know climbing a cliff in the middle of the night is they all agreed beforehand that if any of them fell, they would do so quietly. Because if you fall and you scream, which is you know the normal response because you're falling and you're like, oh no, or something like that, if you make noise when you fall, then the Nazis are going to be alerted and they're just going to be able to look over that cliff and fire down and kill everybody. So despite multiple members of the 442nd actually falling during this climb, none of them made a sound. They get up there just as dawn is coming around. They take out the uh, the position because the Nazis aren't ready for an attack from behind them. So in one night, the 442nd cleared out a position that we couldn't clear out for months because they um, climbed up behind it. So uh, again, 442nd, pretty cool. Let's move into the fighting in the Pacific theater. So let's start with what Murica is uh, approaching with the uh, Pacific theater here. Um, this is another little historical tidbit for me to point out to you. This is one of the most famous um, like war photographs from American history. It's made into a bunch of like statues and like little uh, like you know desktop statue things and everything. This is a staged photo. It is not real. Um, this did actually happen. Uh, they they did plant this flag. Uh, you know when they when they took the island. But uh, basically, what happened is there was a photographer that saw it. Like they, they had finished doing it and he was like, oh man, that'd be a good picture. Take it down and do it again. So um, this is them posing, like they're reenacting planting the flag here. So it's it's a real event, but it's not like, it, it's a staged event as well. So anyway, moving on to what we're doing here. We need to build up after Pearl Harbor. We obviously cannot um, immediately attack out. So America is going to start on the defensive in the Pacific. Uh, we do, you know, small attacks here and there. We harass Japanese forces and supply lines, but mostly, mostly we are trying to get better communication uh, lines to Australia, fortify those lines, fortify our defenses there, because Australia is basically the last stronghold we have in like that part of the world. We have Hawaii over on the American side because Japan wasn't able to completely destroy the dry docks and everything. And then we have Australia because Japan took everything else um, with the attack on Pearl Harbor. They also invaded the Philippines. They attacked Southeast Asia. Um, we're pretty much stuck in these two areas now. So we're going to fortify the areas we do have so that we can you know, start doing something. We then decide to use Australia as our uh, pushing point. Because as you can see on this map here, Hawaii is, you know, pretty far out in the Pacific, but it's also still pretty dang far away from Japan. This is a lot of uh, territory to cover there. And notice there's really nothing in between here. This is pretty much open ocean. Whereas you compare Australia to that and like, 
there's a lot of islands you can kind of go to and start basing your stuff off of. So we decide that we are going to um, start driving north from Australia. And mostly we do that after this thing called the Battle of Midway, which I believe, I think I talk about when we get to Japan. Um, man, my, my brain is way too scattered right now. I'm usually much more effective at doing this. Um, so in case I don't talk about it with Japan, basically Midway is the turning point where Japan um, gets a mix of bad luck and bad tactical choices and um, their fleet gets not completely decimated, but uh, it takes a pretty big blow and Japan starts taking a back foot and being on the defensive uh, basically for the rest of the war. So we, when we do start pushing out, we actually push out from Australia, uh, which was kind of the plan all along. China is meanwhile still doing stuff as well. Um, we thought that China would be a good place to attack from, especially doing like bombing runs against Japan because it's so close to Japan. But in order to do that, we would have to take over Northern China, which we never really managed to do until the end of the war. So we keep on giving military and financial support to China, but it doesn't really work out. Mostly um, there's a lot of infighting going on between our allies, the nationalists and the, uh, the communists who are opposing them. There's a lot of guerrilla fighting going on. There's just no way we can do, um, you know, aerial attacks and bombardments from China for basically the entire war because we're never able to get um, control over that area. What we end up doing then is this thing called island hopping. And to make this make sense, let me go back really quick to our map here. Oop, that was one too far. Look at how many islands there are here. And also out here, we don't really need to worry about those ones that much. We're mostly looking here. That is so many islands. Think of how long it's going to take to go and take over every single island on there. And especially when you get to these ones, like this area here, each little like collection of, of letters that you can't really read because it's too small right there, that's an island. Those are a lot of islands. And Japan is going to start doing what we did at the beginning of the war. They're going to fortify the heck out of those islands. So, come on, there we go. If we want to effectively fight this war, we cannot take every single island. But we don't need to take every single island because we take one strategic island and then we hop to the next strategic island. What are those Japanese forces in between going to do? They're stuck on fortified islands. They're not going to be able to come attack us. They don't have any fleet in the area. Like they're just sitting on those islands doing nothing now, right? So we just are going to hop to the islands that are important to us and take the ones that we need, the ones that we have to have. Because basically what we want islands for are supply, like refueling bases, basically. The reason why we can't just bomb the heck out of Japan, which is what we wanted to do the whole war, is because it's too far away. Our planes can't make it there and back. We did one raid called the Doolittle Raids in response to Pearl Harbor, and it was basically just a suicide mission because the, the planes had to be taken almost all the way by aircraft carrier, and then the aircraft carriers couldn't get that close, so the planes had to fly so far that they didn't have enough fuel for a return trip. That's not sustainable. You can't just send a bunch of planes on, on bombing runs they're not going to return from. So we need those islands to be able to keep on pushing forward and get close enough to do what we really want to do, which is bomb Japan. And we'll talk later about um, how horrifically that goes. So Japan then is... Um, going to also have their own approach here. Um, you know, who who really won the war here? Is it America winning World War II or is it Japan winning the World Beyblade Championship of 2012? I mean, I feel like we know what the real answer there is. So Japan is starting out on the offensive. It's basically the exact opposite of America, right? Pearl Harbor happens, they, they do their thing, they fail to destroy the American fleet, which was their goal, and... Um, it's a mixed bag. They drive America out of the Philippines, so they're feeling pretty good about that. But what they have screwed up is they um, did not take the advice of those doubters in the Japanese government that pointed out, if we don't immediately beat America, we have a timeline of about two years before we lose. And um, turns out they had a little bit more than two years. They had about three and a half years. But... Uh, they're going to end up having this happen to them. So they start out on the offensive, they're doing good. In China, 
they're stuck. Japan cannot get out of China. They thought they were going to do well first and had themselves a nice dinner of uh, some nice crawfish there. And now they're just stuck in the corner crying because China won't surrender. And now the USA and Britain have joined in and the USSR will get there eventually. Um, so they're not able to really put their full focus onto America as they had planned because they cannot get out of China. They're stuck there. By the way, this picture makes me kind of sad as like a parent. I can't imagine intentionally like I I would like I would probably cry if this was happening to Amelia. And these people are like put more crawfish there and take a picture. Like, that poor child is terrified for his very life right there. This by the way might be my favorite meme. The, at least the, the ones that I am able to use in these powerpoints. <laughs> this meme is is quality it's it's maybe a little bit inappropriate um you know for school use but i feel like it's okay it's it's not like grossly inappropriate it's just an, it's an amazing meme that's all i'm saying so um midway happens and it looks like as i was worried about i just talk around midway this whole time basically what happens is there's really bad weather that hides the american planes coming in uh japan had a bunch of their aircraft carriers out with the uh with the bays open and the bombs were, were basically um out for everything to see and the american bombs hit their bombs and things blew up and japan loses a bunch of their aircraft carriers and now they're in a uh, terrible position so they start fortifying into caves and bunkers and going into hardcore turtle island defense mode what they're really hoping is they can grind america down at this point japan when they start losing is when they start trying to um look for ways to negotiate peace. But America always comes back with that unconditional surrender demand. So what Japan is hoping by fortifying all these islands is they can make it so costly that every time America invades an island, they have to lose thousands of soldiers, that eventually America will just, um, our morale will wear down and we will not want to fight anymore. And we will agree to something that's not unconditional surrender. As they get to the very end of the war, um, Japan really starts having a hard time because they are very much running out of supplies. Remember, they had estimated about two years before they were running out of supplies, right? So uh, when we eventually did take Japan, a lot of the uh, American observers that came into Japan were surprised to find things like all the um, like the railways on stairs and the guardrails on highways and everything, they had all been ripped out because they were metal. And Japan needed metal so badly that they were ripping that stuff out, melting it down, and turning it into other things they can use. They had a bunch of old damaged planes and not enough like bullets, not enough uh, jet fuel to actually have them out there. Um, they had the soldiers to fight, but not the supplies to fight. So they started doing things like kamikaze. Uh, kamikaze were very much not a thing that were used during the entirety of World War II. They were used at the very, very end of the war when Japan was basically on its, uh, its last legs. And you might be like, wait a minute, that's a terrible idea. They're low on supplies, so they send in planes to blow themselves up. Again, the planes they were sending in were old, damaged planes. Sometimes towards the end of the war, they were basically just wooden gliders. Um, they would make planes out of wood and they would like launch them with a slingshot off of the aircraft carrier and they had just enough fuel in them to get to a, a ship and make an explosion because the, the metal from the plane doesn't cause the explosion, right? It's the fuel in the plane that causes the explosion. So the idea is they, they're going to use what they can to damage American ships in any way they can. Um, and so they, they start you know sending these kamikaze pilots to crash their planes into American ships. The psychological impact of this is huge, right? Like you're seeing these pilots that are willing to blow themselves up to attack you and it looks really scary, but they don't actually do much. Because think about it, the average kamikaze pilot, as you can see in this picture here, where are they going to hit the ship? They're going to hit the deck of the ship. And like this one, there's not even a hole blown. In, like there's a lot of fire, but they didn't even manage to blow a hole in the ship. And even if they did, that hole's on the deck of the ship. How are you going to sink a ship by blowing a hole on the top of the deck, right? You'd have to hit the side of the ship, which is going to be really hard to do as a kamikaze pilot. 
So this is a good sign of how desperate Japan was. It's not exactly a, um, a effective or legitimate tactic for fighting, though. Um, it's more of a, a flashy thing that caught a lot of attention. Um, usually we would watch some videos with this in the interest of time. We're probably not going to. Um, we would usually watch some stuff from Letters v uh, from Iwo Jima, which is a really good uh, movie. There's also this really cool documentary called Wings of Defeat, where um, not every kamikaze pilot actually died. Some of them um, basically like were sent out and they couldn't find a ship, or um, they were trained to go out and they just didn't get a chance to go out before the war ended. And this woman interviews a bunch of kam uh, kamikaze pilot kamikaze pilots. I'm losing my ability to speak now, and. Um, it's it's really interesting to hear them talk about um, their experience with it. I might end up just linking that video on there in case you're you know you have any interest in this topic and you want to watch it. It's it's um, it's a perspective you don't usually get to see. Usually people are just like, wow, these kamikaze pilots are like insane fanatics that like didn't care for their lives at all. Um, and hearing them talk about it is a very very different experience. So uh, anyway, that's it for this particular lecture. Uh, we got two more for this week, plus our last uh, document assessment. So we'll get going on those uh, with the next one. Thank you. Bye.